In this video, we consider the two other main assumptions, independence in the data and linearity of the model. As in the prior video, we will first consider how to detect it, then secondly how to deal with violations of the assumption, and finally, how to know when we have adequately dealt with it. Independence in the data is required so that we can use the central limit theorem. We've considered this several times before, but to recap, independence can be seriously and easily violated in engineering processes. We do this when there is a relationship between some of the samples and the others. Independence is a topic covered in the area of study called time series analysis. There are many good books on this topic, two of which are shown here and recommended on the screen. What I'm going to look at is a quick way to detect one form of lack of independence in the data. We can often observe it visually. When we plot our residuals, or our y values, or our x values in time order, or sequence order, we might notice slow moving drifts, rapid crisscrossing, or some other cycles and trends in the data. These are all indications of lack of independence, since we see a relationship between one sample and the others. So the easiest way to detect this is to plot the data and observe whether relationships exist. You may not always notice this with your eye, so let me show you one way we can detect lack of independence, the simplest way, and it happens when one sample is related to the samples following it. We can detect it quite easily when we plot our data against each other on a scatter plot, as shown next. For example, here I'm taking roughly a thousand samples and I plot observations x1, x2, x3, x4 up to a thousand on the horizontal axis, and on the vertical axis I plot those against samples x2, x3, x4, x5 up to a thousand and one. Essentially, we are plotting the data time shifted one sample apart on a scatter plot to detect if there's a relationship. Now, if there's truly no relationship, for example, between x1 and x2, x2 and x3, x3 and x4, and so on, then this plot should appear as shown here on the left, where I've used pure random numbers which have no relationship. However, if we do observe a relationship on the plot, it might be as shown here on the right, where I've created data where there is a known relationship. These data show a positive correlation, which indicates that one sample is related to the one following it. If the current sample value is above average, then the one that follows it will also be above average, and vice versa. So the assumption of independence is violated for the data on the right. What we can do here is to calculate the correlation for these two plots. On the left, we have that there's no relationship, and the correlation value is an extremely small number. On the right, there is a strong relationship, and we observe that in the correlation value as well. Now let's go repeat this process, but let's skip one sample value. Plot observations x1 up to 1000 on the horizontal axis, and plot observations x3, x4, x5 up to 1002 on the vertical axis. If the data truly have no relationship again, we should still observe a small correlation as shown here on the left. But here on the right, we observe that a relationship is still present between every second value in the data. x1 and x3 are related, x2 and x4 are related, and so on. But notice that this time the correlation number is smaller than when we plotted the data one sample apart. We can go repeat this yet another time. Plotting the data three samples apart, we can go observe these correlation values on the left and on the right. Plotting the data four samples apart, I start to notice now that my correlation value here on the right has dropped yet again and now is starting to be very small. Eventually, even on a slow moving process, we will find a point in time where that correlation value drops below a certain threshold. We can confidently say there is no further relationship between those samples. But recall, even for entirely random, unrelated data, we will always observe a small but non-zero correlation. So we have to have some form of cutoff, and that's what we're going to see next, visually. What we have here on the screen is what's called the autocorrelation plot, a really great compact visualization of a lot of information. When we plot these correlation values for successive sample spacings, we use vertical spikes. The horizontal axis shows the number of gaps in the samples. The technical term is to call that the number of lags. For example, this spike at lag 2 is when I was plotting x1 against x3 and x2 against 4 on the scatter plot. 
That value at the tip of the spike is the correlation number for that plot. And we can go repeat this for lag 3, 4, 5 and so on. Now for the data set that was purely random data with no relationship, we observed no significant spikes other than the spike at zero lags apart. Zero lags is when the data are plotted exactly against themselves. And for that, the correlation is, by definition, equal to 1.0. Any data set is perfectly correlated with itself at zero lags apart. At successive lags, lags 1, lag 2, lag 3, we observe no significant correlation. All of these lie within the dashed blue lines, which are bounds that represent when the correlation is not significant. Now when plotting the autocorrelation function for the data that I created with a known relationship, we observe that the data are correlated with itself up to about the fourth lag. Beyond that, we say the data are not related to each other anymore. The practical interpretation of this is that if we went back to that process and used every fourth sample, in other words sample 1, 5, 9, 13 and so on, then we are guaranteed that those data are now independent. In fact, I can show this to you in R. If I take the original data set here and take every fourth sample and then plot the autocorrelation of that modified subsampled data set, we observe that the autocorrelation function shows it only has one significant lag at position zero and then no significant lags after that. So what I've shown here is a way to detect for lack of independence in the data. And I've also shown you how to deal with it by subsampling the data till there are no significant lags remaining. We know that we have dealt with this when the autocorrelation function shows only a significant lag at zero. So for our regression models, we should plot the autocorrelation function on our residuals and on our y values to check that there is no significant autocorrelation with the data. If we do observe a significant correlation beyond the zeroth lag, we should subsample our data and rebuild our model. The final assumption to discuss is that of an incorrect model specification. We know that our models and our systems are usually nonlinear over a wide range. But over a small range, the model's purpose of predicting y values might be useful, even though it's not technically correct. One way we can detect whether our models are correctly specified is by plotting the predicted y values, y hat, against the residuals, or the x values against the residuals. If we observe a pattern in that plot, then we know that we have not specified the model correctly. After all, the residuals, by definition, should contain no information. And if there's a pattern in that plot of the residuals, it indicates there is information remaining in the data, and we can likely improve our model by changing the model specification. Here, for example, we see a model where if you look carefully enough, you can notice a quadratic shape in the plot of x against y, though it's not necessarily obvious. The residuals, however, when plotted against x, or the residuals when plotted against y predicted, as shown here on these other two plots, shows a very strong sense of curvature. That dashed blue line has been added by using the LOESS, L-O-W-E-S-S, -S, function that I've shown you previously. So that's how to detect it, and we can deal with this problem in at least two ways. One way is to use a nonlinear least squares model. We won't go into the detail of that for this course, except to say that our objective function then fits a nonlinear function directly and finds the sum of squares of the errors so that that is minimized. The mathematics behind that objective function though becomes far more difficult because there's a nonlinear function inside there. There are built-in tools in R for fitting nonlinear least squares, so you can investigate that on your own time. One other way we could deal with this issue is by transforming our x or y variables. This is likely not new to you. You've certainly seen this in a lab course where rather than using your original x variable, you use some transformed version of it. For example, you could take the square root of x or the log of x and then go use those transformed variables in your model. Now you should not go use these transformations simply by trial and error. There is a systematic theory behind them. We can take our x value and raise it to a certain power of p and that becomes our transformed x. These transformations, raising by a power of p, follow what is called a ladder, where the transformations become more aggressive as we move up the ladder or more aggressive as we move down the ladder. The base case, of course, is where p is equal to 1, the case of no transformation. We can take p up to higher values, such as 1.5, 1.75, 
or a square transformation of 2.0. As we go to these higher values, that transformation is more aggressive. We can also step down the ladder. A value of p equals to 0.5 corresponds to a square root. But we can go a little further, 0.25, we can even go to negative values of p, minus 0.5, minus 1, which corresponds to inverting x, minus 1.5, and minus 2, which corresponds to the inverted square of x. These also become more aggressive as you go further down the ladder. Now the log transformation is also commonly used, and it fits into this ladder quite nicely. It approximates the point where p is equal to 0 in terms of the severity of the log transformation. A third way that we can deal with incorrect model specification is by rearranging our first principles equation to linearize it. Some linearizations are shown over here on the screen. Inverse temperatures, logs of pressures, taking the logs of the equations on the left and right hand side to expand them out into linear form. These are all things that are possible and likely something you've done before. You can be as inventive as you like, and we are typically guided by the underlying theoretical model of the system we're trying to build the regression model for. Now we know that we've done an adequate job of our model transformation when we see no further structure in the residual plots. We can move up and down the ladder of transformations or apply model linearizations until we observe no particular structure remaining in the residuals, and then we know that our work is finished. Now in the next video, we start to look at outliers, as you can see in the discussion prior, residuals play an important role in least squares models. And so it is suitable that in the next video, we start to examine residuals and outliers in more depth.